We have breaking news in the WBLT newsroom. This massive fire. Here in the recycling plant, the flames are still burning. Continue to hear more of those loud explosions. Fire department saying that's because of propane tanks. The fire is burning right behind your building. You see, there's houses that are right here next to the fire. Again, they are evacuating some 65 homes. In the way that this could have gone, I think it was a great job by Knoxville Fire Department. Keith, let's try and show this. Uh, this is something that I was able to shoot. What I did is I walked up next to this building and then back through the woods. That's the main meat of the fire. That's the recycling plant. There's the railroad tracks that separate these homes and this business, and the fire is right next to it. There were mounds of materials there because of the black smoke, likely plastic. There are paper and uh, cardboard, which is one of the reasons the fire probably started and spread so quickly. And then those booms were here, folks. We've been told by a couple of experts, including uh, DJ Corcoran with the fire department and the folks here at Coastal Supply, that those are likely empty propane tanks that are being recycled. They just get so hot that they blow, they expand and blow. They just pushed us back as we continue to hear more of those loud explosions. Right now, the fire department is saying that's because of propane tanks. Just what you heard right there, those loud explosions. We've heard about a dozen or so just within the past 10 minutes. See, there's houses that are right here next to the fire. Um, what they have not done and we have not seen on these houses is telling these people to leave. This little yellow house right here, Keith, I don't know if you can get that. The man who owns that house and lives in that house is about a block away and he's very nervous right now, concerned that this fire could kick, could catch and spread. This paper is starting to come down more. This is the first, this is actually the largest piece that we've been able to get that's actually we've caught here. That's a pretty solid piece of paper uh, and it's still kind of just coming down behind us. As we circle the area up, you can see uh, how thick the smoke is, you can see how dense it is and uh, I will give you um, I'm going to try to get back around and maybe come in from a different angle right now, but this gives you a pretty good idea of what we're seeing from the air. A malfunctioning piece of equipment within the recycling plant seems to have sparked this fire. That's the initial determination from fire investigators. We're also learning 25 employees who work at the Fort Loudon Waste and Recycling Plant have evacuated safely. John lives about two or three homes down this way. First, tell me how you found out about it and then what you did. John Human, another boom. Uh, so I was driving in the neighborhood um, right before the fire trucks actually made it to uh, the plant. And so I came over here immediately and when I got out there was embers burning everywhere. I got my hose out, I was spraying the yard, uh, spraying embers that flew on the roof. You guys okay? You guys okay? There's a gas line up here? There's a gas line on the tracks right there. Is that something to watch out for? We're on TV live, by the way, just so you know. So, so we got the fire burning here. Yes, uh, it's really red hot right there. You say they're shooting right where your house is. Yeah. Is your house okay? Well, yeah, yeah, it's okay. They said it wasn't gonna get over there. It might make it to the trees, but it's not gonna go across the fence. This is something. Yeah, we just got the call. Whoa, something just blew up there. Wow. You guys get going. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. It is so big that Chief Meteorologist Heather Haley can now see it on her radar. So this is the perspective of that plume of smoke coming out of North Knoxville. Uh, folks in Union County into Granger County, you could easily be seeing some of this smoke. We have learned that they're working to bring an excavator in to potentially help crews get to the source of the fire. We are now inside the site where the fire has been burning. You can get an idea of how much has been contained how much of this the firefighters have been able to tackle. This is the uh, recycling plant. You see tons of tin, metal, these metal buildings here that have melted. What we have here are the ends being beaten back by firefighters, but there is an intense but condensed blaze still burning in the center. Most of the homes around us are evacuated tonight. People having to spend the night with friends in hotels or at a shelter. It's not sure when people are not clear when people will be able to move back, but we do know that fire is probably going to rage for days. That heavy rain just keeps on going. We had about three inches of rain, the possibility of another two inches of additional rain in the heart of Knox County. This is usually a little creek and it's just out of control. I'm on Concord Street. This water is extremely deep. 
We've been here 10 years and I've never seen it get up even close to this. Several teams are doing swift water rescues. You can see right here behind me is the minivan still trapped. The water completely up over the hood now. We've been out here for a few minutes and the water continues to rise. Right in front of us, a Honda just plows right through the flood water. People are honking at her and stuff. So he's getting the, looks like a kid out of the back seat, my goodness. So the officer is carrying the child. There's your police officer. He's getting another child out. About a dozen cars floating in the water in Lenore City. This is Dr. Marty's car care. It's along East Broadway Street, and he says these are customers' cars that he's been trying to work on. He's never seen flooding this bad before. Didn't think it was going to get this bad, so we didn't move his cars this morning. The crews got Anderson and his two dogs across safely, walking through the current. I can't say enough for them. They, they, they really risk their lives to get me out of there and my dog. We're still working to learn why this guy was in the water in the first place. We had more than a month's worth in about 12 to 15 hours today, but there's more on the way. This is part of Powell High School's property. You can see it is largely underwater tonight. You just tell them, do you want to die? Because if you want to drive, if you're going to drive through it, there's a potential for you doing that. And a lot of folks will stop here and take a picture. But today folks are stopping to take pictures of this incredible site here with all the water that's rushing down. This normally is a, a spill area. This is Perry's Mill. This is where the mill used to be. So you had the overspill. Knoxville police say animal control helped save this dog along with a handful of other pets today. When this storm hit, it just brought all of the debris from the lake that's right in front of the event center. But we're talking uh, there's pillows. Look at this. There's a pillow that's right here. Just kind of shock. This is what's left of Suzanne Vickers three level home. You just don't prepare for something like that. They have never experienced anything like this. They actually don't have flood insurance because they never expected this. That's Kenny Bailey. He runs the new ferry. I grew up here. I've lived here all my life. About 50 people rely on his boat. The commute to their jobs now has a detour. This neighborhood over here, one of these houses just shouted that we had to be rescued during the afternoon yesterday, and they just got power back on five minutes ago. It, it just keeps coming up every day. Never done this. Brandy Anderson's been moving furniture out of her home since last Thursday. It's a frustrating time for this single mom while the water keeps rising. It's just a matter of time. It's going to keep going up. It goes up every day. But the water has been up to two feet inside Erica Grandstaff's home uh, over the past three weeks. She's actually had to move. She and her six kids have lived in this house for the past 25 years. And now the home she wanted to pass to her kids is probably going to be condemned. We got some aerial footage and some shots inside the home. I can tell you the black bolt already forming. Flames shooting through the roof of one of Tennessee's oldest courthouses. We have all hands on deck covering the breaking news we were first to tell you about. We've just been told to move out of the way. There's too much smoke here. Justin, we watched one of your Facebook lives. The smoke was so bad, firefighters actually started moving you back. An emotional night for a lot of people because of what's been lost there. It just brings tears to my eyes. Part of history is going to be destroyed. We've got full length videos from our crews. Yeah, you can see it all in the WVLT News app. Make sure you sign up for that. It looks like it's appearing to grow. The ladder trucks have gone what appears to be back up. I'm not sure if they're going to spray with those ladder trucks. The mayor of Loudoun County asking us to back up now. It appears that it's going to be getting worse. We're moving this way, everybody. We've been asked by law enforcement to move out of the way. There are several people out here kind of taking in what's going on uh, here in the downtown Loudoun area. I need y'all to find a clear place where there's no smoke to go. Okay? Yes, sir. We've just been told to move out of the way. There's too much smoke here by the Loudoun County Fire Department. <clears throat> it's hard to breathe out here. The, the smoke is so thick. The fire department is asking us to back up. We have team coverage from the heart of Loudoun tonight where things are going downhill fast. Part of the roof of the county's historic courthouse has collapsed after that massive fire broke out around dinner time. It is a dangerous situation for the firefighters who are now finally able to get inside the structure and tackle hot spots. It's also been dangerous for about 100 people who are trying to get as close as they can to see what's happening. 
The courthouse has stood longer than anyone has been alive. And you can still probably see some of the smoke kind of rising and some of that hazy fog, but the flames are now completely out. And now you have that real strong smell of that smoke that's going to be lingering here for I'm sure a couple of days. Kind of that reminder of the devastation here tonight. Here's our WBLT News investigation. We were both just babies. I was 17. After decades of marriage, it's only natural that a husband and wife and there's my beautiful wife will settle into defined roles. <laughs> Lois is the jokester. Here's the one where you're trying to show me your muscles. <laughs> Clyde is the fixer. Going in, tearing something out, fixing it, standing back and looking and saying, boy, that really looks a lot better. Uh, that's, that's just my thing. But when Clyde got sick with pancreatitis, I almost lost my life partner. He was the one in need of fixing. Yes. The love of my life, I almost lost him. And I can't imagine it. Very emotional, yes. She says she almost lost Clyde after a home health nurse cared for him. It was just a nightmare after that lady left my home. Lois says the woman who came to care for her husband. Do you remember that baby? That is her, yes. Is identified as Misty Dawn Bacon, the same woman. The Jefferson City Police Department says it's investigating for allegedly posing as a nurse. Lois says Bacon showed up at the house to give Clyde insulin through his food bag. I remember the nurse coming in putting the food bag on me and, and getting me situated and her leaving. And then I remember getting tired and then I sort of went out. He was drooling, he couldn't hold his head up, he couldn't sit up or nothing. Clyde was taken to the now closed Lakeway Regional Hospital back in 2013. Hospital records from that visit show he was admitted because of an overuse of insulin. An East Tennessee nurse says lives were in danger when a woman stole her nursing license number. But Lois says she didn't put two and two together until she watched our exclusive coverage this year. She says that woman used the stolen number to get a job as a home health nurse where she cared for patients illegally. She came in here pretending to be something she wasn't. It was as dangerous as me pretending to be a brain surgeon and going in and doing surgery. And I'm gonna kill that person when I do because I have no clue of what I'm doing. And that was her. Lieutenant Eric Thomas with the Jefferson City Police Department says several others were fooled as well. In fact, he says in Jefferson City alone, four businesses all hired her. He says one of them was this home health care company called Emeticis. Clyde and Lois never contacted the police, but Emeticis did. This report filed with Jefferson City Police by an office manager at Emeticis sparked an investigation by detectives. It alleges that Bacon provided a false birth certificate and a nursing license number belonging to someone else to get the job at Emeticis. Several months after making the report, Dear Mrs. Rimmer, Emeticis then went one step further warning patients with this letter to people like Thomas Rimmer's mother. When we got the letter, it shocked us very well. Well, I mean, it sh shocked us bad. The letter explained that it fired Misty Don Bacon because she, quote, lied about her identity and did not have a nursing license. I was like, oh, no, she took care of my mom. And messing with the meds, it could be harmful to her health. In its report filed with Jefferson City Police, a medicist alleged Bacon engaged in fraud and identity theft, painting a picture of an elaborate lie built on this woman's truth. I received a call from an agent with the TBI. They wanted to let me know that my nursing license um, had been utilized by someone else. Misty Don Vanette is a licensed nurse. Jefferson City Police say Bacon used Vinette's license number to work at a medicis. It is truly terrifying to me, and I would hate to think what she's done and what decisions she's made without having that license. Mm -hmm. She could have potentially killed someone. Lieutenant Thomas says Bacon likely plucked Vinette's license number from this public state database. It lists the name and license number of every healthcare provider in the state of Tennessee and it took me just six seconds to find Misty Vanette's information online.
State officials say the database is there so that you can research providers and see complaints that have been filed against them before making appointments. But Vanette says it left her vulnerable. All of our personal information is accessible online with that number. It may just be a license number, but it's a license number. Lieutenant Thomas says that this case reaches far beyond Jefferson City. He says in January of this year, he teamed up with the TBI and determined that Bacon had pulled the same stunt in so many other jurisdictions, it was best to ask the U.S. Attorney's Office to open one unified case. The TBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office will not confirm if they have an open investigation and criminal charges have not been filed against Bacon. We couldn't find any record of civil charges filed against her either. So what does she say about the accusations? Hello. This is Amanda. We're hoping that we can get your side before it airs. The only thing I want to say is 99% of the stuff that you all are hearing is not true. That is all I want to say. What exactly does Misty Don Bacon dispute? We showed up at her home hoping to find out. We've got a home health care company that says you lied about being a nurse. Is that true? She don't have any comments. Like I said before. Misty didn't answer. Instead, she walked inside the home and shut the door. It's very scary. So you hear about a situation like this, and as a doctor, your mind goes where? Senator Richard Briggs is a medical doctor and also represents parts of Knox County. Well, first of all, this is one of the most egregious cases that I've heard about. So how does this happen? Well, the state does not require fingerprint verification in order for a health care provider to get a job. So Senator Briggs says the only answer is lawsuits. He says that'll force companies to change their background check policies. But Clyde isn't the suing type. Sure, I could have probably sued and got lawyers and went through all this and I don't know, maybe got a, a few dollars. Instead, the fixer at heart and his wife prefer to sound the alarm using the one tool they have, their voices. I just hope this will help someone, I really do. Ever who she was around, maybe they'll see it and maybe it'll give them courage to step forward with it. Major developments on a story that we were first to break. Back in August, we aired Amanda's investigation. It focused on a woman who at the time was accused of posing as a nurse. Well, today her alleged victims tell me months of fighting for justice has finally paid off. We broke the news this afternoon that Misty Don Bacon has signed a federal plea deal. Court documents show that she agrees to plead guilty to wire fraud, health care fraud, and using the identities of real nurses to pass herself off as legit. Misty Don Bacon signed the agreement Monday. It was filed in court this morning. Misty, anything at all you want to say? Misty Don Bacon said nothing. The Knoxville woman accepted a plea agreement in federal court. Anything you want to say to those alleged victims? Bacon pleaded guilty to using the identities of real nurses to pass herself off as legit. Her boyfriend was by her side. Anything you would like to say? I'd like for you to get out of my face. Earlier this year, we talked to Clyde and Lois Harless. The couple told us Bacon was Clyde's home health nurse and gave him too much insulin. He later went to the hospital. It's scary. It's, I, I can't imagine life without him. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, knowing that I could have been gone. Now they're spending the holidays together, knowing nearly seven years ago could have been Clyde's last. When my husband first got sick, and they brought her into my home to take care of him. My full trust was in her. They're still fighting for justice and new laws. Misty and her boyfriend continued without comment. So did her attorney, Nikki Pierce. Ms. Pierce, is there anything you want to say on behalf of your client? She said nothing. Misty will be back in court in April for sentencing. In Greenville, Robert Grant, WVLT News. Bacon faces up to 45 years in prison and up to $750,000 in fines. This is WVOT News. Now, that's not the only controversial comment our cameras captured coming from a severe county commissioner last night. We're going to get to more explosive comments and moments that you'll only see here on WVLT News. Justin, plenty of city and county leaders have stepped forward tonight, really trying to distance themselves from the commissioner's comments. Is anyone showing any real concern about this? 
Yeah, Amanda, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, and Sevierville all coming out against those statements from that commissioner last night. Well, the head of Sevier County Democrats was at the meeting last night and ended up walking out of that meeting. Our Robert Grant spent time with her today, and Robert, surprisingly, Sarah Thompson, she doesn't want a resignation. She simply wants an apology. Exactly that, Amanda. Sarah Thompson says it was painful to hear the commissioner's comments, but tonight she's only asking for an apology. If there are currently laws that the petitioners find fault with. A gun proposal brought Sarah Thompson to Monday night's county commission meeting. She spoke out against the proposal, then heard something she never expected. I got a choir around for, for fresh. <laughs> Commissioner Warren Hurst's comments drove her away. I was actually incensed. I think that was a very demeaning and nasty thing to even talk about. So I stood up and said, excuse me, this is unprofessional. Commissioner Hurst has uh, arrived for the meeting. He got here about 15 minutes ago or so and went around the room and, and greeted other commissioners. We're talking quietly because the door is open and they have just called the meeting to order with a prayer. Hurst really didn't say anything tonight publicly. He did not say anything publicly. He did speak to a couple of commissioners. As you said, Ted, when he entered the room, he shook their hands and greeted them almost a business as usual. But tonight we had another room full of people, this time wanting to speak on a different topic, which included him. Commissioner Warren Hurst entered the commission room by shaking hands with other commissioners several minutes before the meeting was called to order. He stayed quiet throughout the meeting as speakers took to the podium, both supporting his comments and denouncing them treat others the way that you want to be treated. And I don't think that necessarily you meant the words that you said in the way that you said them. And if you do, I'm sorry. That doesn't represent the Bible that I read. The equality sought by some is equality denied to one, the one in whom spoke. And Mr. Hurst, I want to thank you. I support you. Mr. Hurst uh, then left the room, did not uh, answer any of our questions for comment after that. You know, it's incredible the amount of rain we've gotten in the last few days and the conditions it's created. Things like this and like this. I mean, I mean it's unbelievable. But here on campus, we've got a baseball game going on. No, flooding and baseball don't typically go together. But thanks to the new artificial surface, rain's really not an issue. Oh! Come on, I give hey, Caleb, up. Caleb, I... Caleb, Caleb. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, listen, we got NCAA basketball 2010 going on right here. We're playing Tennessee against Kentucky, and they made me play with Kentucky, so I'm losing on purpose. We'll just say that. Look, we got students out here outside Thompson Bowling Arena camping out like what, like 19 hours before tip off tomorrow against Kentucky? Gotta love this. Let's check it out. Now, a couple hours before tip-off, they'll open up these doors and there'll be a mad rush to get the best seats possible. Hold her up tight. Make a little love in. A little turn down and on to me. <laughs> what, what was that? Nah, come on, what, what was that? Loving on the Mason Dick Sunlight. Fist ball, talking trash. Yeah, there's guys, been beef this season. It was almost like a standoff. But Tennessee's beef comes wrapped up in a tortilla shell with lettuce. His name is Colin Castleberry goes by the TBA taco. Come get some taco! Come get some taco! How does it feel to have this beautiful orange in the middle? The All Scripture Baptist Church says on its website that God says homosexuality should be punished by death. The website also says homosexuals are not allowed to attend church or join the church. I preach what the Bible says, and what the Bible says is not popular. Grayson Fritz defends his comments outside All Scripture Baptist Church. I'm just saying one of the laws of the United States should be to put homos to death. Right. Amen. Amen. Fritz is a detective with the Knox County Sheriff's Office. He says his beliefs never interfered with his work. If I worked at the Burger King and someone from the LGBT community came in and they ordered a hamburger, I would make them a hamburger because that was what my job would be. You understand? Even if I felt differently towards that person and felt exactly what the way I feel and believe, I would still do my job. Sheriff Tom Spangler says Fritz is taking early retirement and is on paid sick leave until late July. Fritz delivered his Wednesday night sermon as he has for about two years as pastor. His message? Standing up for the right things, you know, and being persecuted, you know, for doing the right things. His comments also sparking an investigation by District Attorney General Charm Allen. 
She said in a statement, I always have and always will prosecute fairly and justly based on the law and the evidence. Before his latest sermon, someone left this note outside the church. It said, Dear Pastor Fritz, I don't know what happened to you, but I am so sorry. Love thy neighbor. And I turned and he somehow got out the door. And it happens so fast. Every time I close my eyes at night to go to sleep, replays in my head. It was the worst day. Don't ever think it won't happen to you because it came. It is a public health crisis. It's the leading cause of death in children. We're failing them. Our culture is failing them. We have to change the conversation. We want to ensure they're able to help themselves around water. We need to know how to swim. It's just a life-saving skill. It's a crisis for sure. And I don't think people realize it. Hello and thanks for joining us for a WVLT News special presentation, Crisis in the Water. I'm Brittany Tarwater. Drowning is the number one cause of death in children ages one to four, aside from birth defects, and the second leading cause of death in our teenagers, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Now, you may think this comes a little late. It's the end of summer, and swim season is coming to a close. Well, I like to call the rest of the year, especially the fall, learn to swim season. As a swimmer my whole life, the statistics of drowning make me worry for the health and future of our children's safety. On top of all the fears and concerns I already have as I'm about to become a new mother, I want to know how I can protect my own child from losing his life in the water because even as a swimmer, I didn't know the dangers. Why isn't the number one killer of our babies a conversation that pediatricians are having with parents at every well child visit? Why aren't there strict swimming guidelines that every parent knows about? Well, now there are. I've spent the last year talking with families across the country and here in East Tennessee who are sharing the deep heartache of losing their babies to drowning, but who are brave enough to push for change to save the lives of other children. Over the next 30 minutes, we're talking about the danger surrounding water for our children and what we can do to save them. What products experts say we should be using and which ones we may think are safe, but are doing more harm than good. Not just young children, but risks for teenagers as well. How does drowning kill teens who think they know how to swim? And finally, practicing safe swimming for life. Swim lessons lessen the likelihood of a child drowning by nearly 90%. We'll have tips on how to choose the right swim lessons for your children. This is WVLT News. <laughs> Now, that's not the only controversial comment our cameras captured coming from a severe county commissioner last night. We're going to get to more explosive comments and moments that you'll only see here on WVLT News. But first, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Amanda Hara. Ted Hall is off. Hashtags calling for a boycott of Sevier County are trending on Twitter, but can Warren Hurst's homophobic comments keep people away from our beautiful Smokies? Justin McDuffie joining us live from the Forge tonight. Justin, plenty of city and county leaders have stepped forward tonight, really trying to distance themselves from the commissioner's comments. Is anyone showing any real concern about this? Yeah, Amanda, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, and Sevierville all coming out against those statements from that commissioner last night. Now, since that meeting, a hashtag boycott Sevier County has been trending on social media, but I talked to plenty of visitors here tonight, none really wanting to go on camera, but they said nothing could really keep them from visiting the place that they love, the Smoky Mountains. Plenty of stuff to do here for them, and they love coming back time and time again. Now, the Pigeon Forge tourism director says that they're not too worried that these man's one, one man's comments will hurt their tour tourism industry. It's our job to reassure people that they're going to be safe when they visit here. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier in my comments, any season of the year, 80% of the people who come here are repeat guests and they would not be coming here if they were not being well treated. Many of these people come as many as nine or 10 times a year. Yeah, nine or 10 times a year. Shocking number, but many of us know that that number probably not a surprise to some. Now, Pigeon Forge says that they plan to keep putting that message out there that all are welcome here throughout the year, anytime. Amanda? 
All right, Justin McDuffie, we should also note Dollywood among the list of businesses and county officials to step forward today and condemn the commissioner's comments. Justin McDuffie reporting for us tonight. We want to hear from you on this. Do you think that the comments will hurt tourism in Sevier County? You can open the WVLT app right now. Some of the results already coming in. 32% of you saying yes, you do think that this could hurt tourism. 68% of you saying no. We're going to continue to follow this poll. We'll bring you results throughout the newscast. Now there is more to that exclusive video that we captured at last night's commission meeting. Commissioner Hurst also calls certain Democrats thugs. We're being run by thugs from these other countries. We've got to run for president in the Democratic primary today. We've got thugs. We just got rid of one. Running the spread. One president. I guess. Folks. Well, the head of Sevier County Democrats was at the meeting last night and ended up walking out of that meeting. Our Robert Grant spent time with her today, and Robert, surprisingly, Sarah Thompson, she doesn't want a resignation. She simply wants an apology. Exactly that, Amanda. Sarah Thompson says it was painful to hear the commissioner's comments, but tonight she's only asking for an apology. If there are currently laws that the petitioners find fault with. A gun proposal brought Sarah Thompson to Monday night's county commission meeting. She spoke out against the proposal, then heard something she never expected. I got a choir running for, for president. <laughs> <laughs> if that ain't, if that ain't, if that ain't about as ugly as you can. Commissioner Warren Hurst's comments drove her away. I was actually incensed. I think that was a very demeaning and nasty thing to even talk about. So I stood up and said, excuse me, this is unprofessional. Thompson is the chair of the Sevier County Democrats. She says Hearst's comments should serve as a reminder to all commissioners. They're elected to represent everyone in, in Sevier County, even those who don't love, look, or vote like they do. We could go over here in Houses Jail and get better people out of <laughs> Some of her comments were met with applause and some laughter at the Monday night meeting. Well, it's painful to hear, but at the same time, I've become so used to it in this county. The Tennessee Equality Project is calling on Hearst to resign, but Thompson doesn't think that's necessary. I think an apology is in order, not just to me, but to every person in this county that doesn't share his viewpoints that he demeaned. Other than that, it's up to the county commission to censor their own. Now we have reached out to all county commissioners so far only heard back from one. Commissioner Greg Haggard says that Hearst comments don't reflect all of county commission and we have reached out also to Hearst again tonight to see if his comments have changed or if he has any more to say about what he has said last night and uh, we have not been able to reach out to him just yet. Amanda, he has not gone back to us. Yeah, Robert, last night he basically told us after this meeting, he said, I still stand by my comments. He told our Kyle Granger that he was then going to be going out of town. We've tried repeatedly today to get in touch with him to see if his stance has changed at all now that people are calling for his resignation. Of course, none of our repeated phone calls have been returned, but this is a part of the story that we will continue to watch and stay on top of. Robert Grant reporting for us tonight in Sevier County. Robert, thanks. We do want to get back to that poll. We want to hear your take on this. Do you think the commissioner's comments will hurt tourism in Sevier County? You can open the WVLT News app right now to vote. We're going to watch the results throughout the show. The latest showing 30% of you now think that those comments could hurt tourism in Sevier County. 70% of you now say no. Let's switch gears and get over to Austin Bowling. He's watching the weather situation for us as we get closer to the weekend. A lot of folks already planning for their days off. Yeah, we're going to be talking about some rain showers that start inching their way back into the picture here later on into the week, uh, more so heading into the weekend. Right now in the wake of the rainfall we started the day with, Cooler air starting to settle in. We're checking in at 50 degrees in Knoxville, one better in Oak Ridge, 49 now over in Sevier County. It's 47 in Newport, down to 45 in Washburn. So overnight tonight, we do expect to see lows dropping down into the lower 40s here across the valley. A chilly start out there, but a little bit of light frost possible up in the plateau once again. So if you do have those fragile plants that can't handle that kind of cold, you want to make sure you bring those in here quickly while you still have the chance. 35 tonight in Crossville, 34 in Jamestown, and expecting uh, some temperatures quite chilly up in that higher elevation. By the time we get into Wednesday afternoon, 
plenty of sunshine. Temperatures still on the cooler side here, right around 65 degrees in the Knoxville area. Same thing in Kingston. You're going to be a little bit milder down towards the south, right around 67 for the folks down in Athens. A little bit cooler, though, up along the plateau where you'll probably want to keep that jacket handy. I think most of you, if you're cold natured, you probably want that jacket handy just in case, even with the sunshine. So another afternoon filled with plenty of 60s out there, but uh, we are dry for Wednesday and Thursday. We start seeing some spotty rain shower chances returning by the time we get into Friday and Saturday. That might be just in time for game time between South Carolina and Tennessee as well. We'll keep our eyes on that, but we are going to talk about how much rain we could expect heading into the back half of the weekend. Coming up here in just a few more minutes, Amanda. All right. We have breaking news now from Alabama. Birmingham police say they believe they've found the body of three-year-old Camille Cupcake McKinney. They believe they found her body in a landfill. She had been missing for 10 days. After she was playing outside at a birthday party, police say two men are now in custody connected to this crime. And a scathing letter from the Knox County Sheriff to the Knoxville News Sentinel criticizing an editorial cartoon. This cartoon appeared in Sunday's edition of the Knoxville News Sentinel. It shows a couple discussing police violence, implying that they could be shot whether they're in their home or not. Sheriff Tom Spangler released a letter in response to this, calling the cartoon wildly inappropriate. We spoke with him exclusively this afternoon. I, I wanted them to know that I was uh, very disgusted with uh, them putting that in the paper. I didn't think it was right. I didn't think for it was fair to portray our officers and any other officer that way. Well, the sheriff says a cartoon sends the wrong message, teaching people to be afraid of officers who he says are here to protect the community. A Middle Tennessee nurse is heading to trial accused of making a mistake and killing a patient in the process. The case is now on the radar of doctors and nurses nationwide. Nick Barris has the story tonight from Nashville. The case is a tone setter. That's why it's important. This could set the tone for more criminal prosecutions for medical mistakes. Former Vanderbilt nurse Redonda Vaught has pleaded not guilty. Two years ago, prosecutors say Vaught meant to give a patient a sedative, but instead administered another drug that paralyzed and killed 75-year-old Charlene Murphy. Vaught's accused of ignoring several safeguards, including failing to read the name on the vial, which led to the wrong drug being given. She knowingly overrode a safety protocol is the allegation. So she consciously accepted a risk assume that risk, knowing that it could harm or kill somebody. Clint Kelly is a well-known local malpractice attorney, not involved in this case, but familiar with the details. In his mind, this is clearly civil medical malpractice. That's clear. The question is, is it criminal behavior as well? The Davidson County District Attorney believes so. Vaught is charged with reckless homicide. At a hearing last week, the case, to the surprise of many, was set for trial. Kelly believes the sides are too far apart for any talk of a plea deal. One side believing I'm helping people and I simply made a mistake, even if it is reckless, versus the other side saying you were reckless and because of that you killed somebody. Well, the DA there is still working on the case, which is set to go to trial next July. TDOT says they're almost done changing those speed limit signs on I-40 and 640. The speed limit in many areas is being raised. And what we're trying to do is get those speed limits to be accurate compared to the way the traffic is moving in these areas. So we found that the speed limits were actually too low. Well, the new speed limit in most spots is 65 miles an hour. I did ask Mark Nagy, who we just heard from with TDOT, I asked him today, is there any chance that we could see those speed limits go even higher in the future? He says at this point, it doesn't look like it. Well, coming up tonight, still an old ambulance has a new mission. Plus, guess who is not playing in Saturday's game? One of South Carolina's best players will not see action against Tennessee this weekend. We'll talk about that up next. And temperatures on the cooler side, a little frosty up along the plateau into the 30s and 40s, but filled with sunshine tomorrow. We'll talk about when the rain comes back up next.
fundraiser so big in Knoxville it needed a red carpet for its Hollywood celebrity. Take a look at this. Dennis Quaid showed off his brand new movie Midway at the Regal Pinnacle in Turkey Creek tonight. The movie premiere also a fundraiser for Variety Children's Charity of East Tennessee, which helps children with disabilities throughout the area. Quaid says he's been all over Tennessee, but is glad that he finally got the chance to come here to Knoxville. The people here is what make it, right? And everybody here is really fantastic tonight. I can really feel a lot of love in the room. And so, uh, what I like about most of the country is that people take care of each other. You have a real feeling of community here. That's great. Yeah, indeed we do. Premieres like this one have helped raise more than $10 million for Variety over the years. The movie Midway, by the way, hits theaters on November 8th. Austin Bowling joining us to talk about the weather, and I see some some rain action behind you. And I think this is one of those times that nobody's really complaining about the rain that we had today. No, and I hope too many people aren't really uh, perturbed by those chances that we picked up here. Again, we still need a lot more than what we've already picked up over uh, the past couple of days here, and we will get another chance coming up here this weekend. The good news about this batch, it will be reflected in the drought monitor that comes out this coming Thursday morning. So hopefully a good chunk of the area will start to be trimmed down at least a category. This is not going to remove all drought, but it is going to get us headed in the right direction. Average this month here in Knoxville is about an inch and two thirds. So far this month, just a little over an inch. So we're about a half inch off the pace and still could stand to see quite a bit more. Notice rainfall totals just today. We did see some heavier rain across parts of Fentress and Cumberland counties late last night back into Monday. So we did see over about an inch and a quarter actually. And then you add on that additional quarter. So about an inch and a half, almost two inches in Crossville. Rockwood, Lansing, also an over an inch. Jacksboro, the same thing, half an inch in Union County, averaging to be about a half inch in downtown Knoxville. Around a third of an inch in Sevierville and not as fortunate up towards the northeast, only around two tenths of an inch up towards Rogersville. The front responsible for those rain showers now working its way off the coast, or at least the east coast, funneling in behind it drier air. Dew point values in the 30s and 40s when we have clear skies, light winds. Temperatures have a tendency of falling towards the dew point. So a chilly start coming up here on Wednesday morning. Heading out to the bus stop, kids prepare, need a jacket, at least a heavier jacket here in Knoxville, around 42 degrees. But there will be some areas up along the plateau that expect to see lows down into the mid 30s. First thing up along the plateau, so keep that in mind, a chilly start first thing tomorrow. Your forecast where you live, rebounding nicely, but still some of you probably want that light jacket just in case. Plenty of sunshine. The wind relaxes. It will be a nice afternoon. 66 in Madisonville. Same thing in Sweetwater. 67 in Athens and Etowah. 62 for you in Crossville and Oneida. 63 Wartburg and in Williamsburg. Same thing up on Jellico. 64 up in Union County and then out towards the east temperatures here into the mid 60s. So get down into the weeds of the forecast. What we're expecting, we're looking at two different models and they're not agreeing. This is the American model, the GFS, and looking towards Friday, it shows a bit of a dip in the jet stream that's progressive, moves through fairly quickly, and that gives us rain chances Friday into Saturday. Where things differ, this is the European model now, and notice at the same time frame, it develops a cutoff load that is much slower to get here. It slows up into parts of Oklahoma and Texas and delays its arrival until about Saturday afternoon and evening with its better rainfall chances. So right now the models not really coming into agreement, so your forecast towards the end of the week, end of the weekend, will likely change as these models start to converge or head one way or the other. So you'll want to check in with Chief Meteorologist Heather Haley in the morning to get the latest information on your weekend forecast. Mid 60s though on Wednesday, 70 on Thursday, more clouds and late showers right now for Friday, mid 60s, isolated showers. You might want the poncho handy just in case for UT against South Carolina. Better chances, I believe, coming in Sunday into Monday of next week with highs hovering around 70. Amanda. All right, I don't know what that 39 is all about, Austin. <laughs> a little cold. I'll just ignore that one. Thanks. An old ambulance is getting a new mission. Claude Melcher spent $1,200 of his own money to buy the fixer upper. At one time, the ambulance rushed to emergencies. Now it's going to respond to a crisis of a different kind. This will be to help the homeless, to serve like 
kettles with soup in there on a cold night. Yeah, Claude knows more about homelessness than most. He was a Baltimore police officer, and years ago, Claude lived out of his car after falling on hard times. Well, a Georgia driver is alive, but take a look at the crash. We actually first reported this a couple weeks ago. Take a look at this now. Authorities say the driver rear-ended a log truck, yet only suffered minor injuries. The Whitfield County Fire Department shared these images on their Facebook page. Firefighters say they had to cut through 30 to 40 logs with chainsaws before they could even start to cut open the car and rescue the driver. We're coming right back with sports. Welcome back, everybody. You know, it's not been just weeks or months. It's been really years. We've talked about Tennessee's offensive line and how much help they needed in that position group. But dare I say, game by game, it appears that unit might be coming together, getting better. And evidence of that came on Saturday in a play that won't look like anything special on the box score. It was about a 10-yard pickup in the middle of the second quarter Saturday against Alabama. But it's about how it happened. Tim Jordan took the handoff and was stuffed pretty quickly, but the offensive line jumped in to help, and they pushed him another seven or eight yards. After the play, just coming back, looking at the linemen and looking at the excitement on their face, I knew I knew it was a play that they really like brought confidence to them. I watched it a couple times. Uh, it was it was a dope play for us because you know that's something we've been trying to do for a, a long time. You know, sort of enforcing our will like that. But uh, you know, it's part of the culture change we got to have around here. And you know, it starts from top bottom from Coach Pruitt, Coach Chaney, Coach Friend, you know, Coach Clemens. They all teach that and they preach it to us every day. And just seeing us do it at one time, it was a great moment. All right. Well, just a few days before Tennessee's matchup with South Carolina, we found out today that the Gamecocks' top running back. Rico Dowdle will likely miss the game with a sprained knee. He was injured on the first play against Florida this past weekend. Well, Tennessee and South Carolina set to kick off at 4 p.m. this Saturday. The Gamecocks a four-point favorite. That is the slimmest spread, though, for Tennessee in over a month since they played Chattanooga. We'll be there for all the coverage. Well, you heard of, you've heard of Friday Night Lights, right? Well, what about Tuesday Night Lights? It's basically the same thing, but a lot more special. It was tonight at Halls High School. Each year the school brings out the student section, cheerleaders, the football team, and lots of fans for what they call Tuesday Night Lights. It's where students in the CDAC class at the school, students with certain disabilities, they get to play football under the lights. Touchdowns. Two touchdowns. Yeah. But these kids really love it. It's just as real to them as anything that you and I would ever experience. And they have a great time. The biggest smile the whole time, uh, throwing the ball on the ground, everyone huddling around them, cheering them on, shouting their name, just loving on them. And that's what I love. Good stuff, man. This is video of Spencer scoring one of his two touchdowns in the game tonight. It's the third year they've put on that event. Well, a quick note in high school football, Carter football coach Scott Meadows will be allowed to coach this Friday night against Gibbs. This comes after the TSSAA granted his appeal. Meadows was ejected late in the game this past Friday night in Carter's game against Central. He told us in a quick statement, he said he's just glad it's behind him and the team. Check out what Lacey King found in Morgan County yesterday. She shared this with me on her Facebook page, on my Facebook page, and she said, look at the picture, zoom in on the head, tell me what this is. TWRA got back with me this morning. They say it's probably a slender glass lizard, which is basically, as you know, Austin, a lizard with no legs, mm -hmm. apparently pretty rare for our area. I said, well, what's the deal with the tail? Because that doesn't look right. And they said, well, it either got run over by a car. What's your, what's your theory? Well, there's three things that make this different from a snake. Uh, it could blink. It has eyelids. It has uh, ear holes on its, on its neck. Mm -hmm. And when it tries to slither away from something like any other mm -hmm. lizard would, it can drop its tail. So a lot of these glass lizards, you can tell there, don't have perfect tails. And they eventually will grow it back like any lizard does. A snake can't do quite the same thing. So those are the three differences. It can blink, it has ears, and it drops its tail. I just think something should stay in the woods. You know what I mean? Like this. <laughs> it should have stayed rare. Right? I can't believe that Lacey got that close to even take a picture. I would have been like, I need a zoom lens. <laughs> 
to get a picture of that? Still but a great shot, though. You're the expert on all things reptiles. Lizards. Reptiles, exactly. <laughs> all right, you're also an expert on the weather, and a lot I of dabble. people care about that as well. <laughs> we'll get down into the mid 30s tonight for the plateau, near 40 here in the valley. Mid 60s for Wednesday, 70 on Thursday, and then we're watching for the potential of rain showers coming back in just a time. Of Do you wish you saw that lizard? I did. I wish I saw that. I'm going to be looking. That would have been your dream come true. <laughs> have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.